Hey everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Simpleton Sermon Podcast. As always, I am your host, Pastor JJ, and we are diving back into the book of Proverbs here in episode whatever this is. I've (laughs) kind of lost track of the episode numbers, but we are into our second sermon in a series on Proverbs called One Coin, Two Sides. Um, And last week we talked about how the line between good and evil runs between each of us. And then this week we're going to look at, all right, but what does it actually look and feel like when God calls us out, when God God gives us some wisdom that maybe we don't really want to hear, you know, we don't always want to um, hear, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, So I am in the New Living Translations in chapter three of the book of Proverbs, and I encourage you to grab your Bible and here we go. One of the all-time greats in baseball was Babe Ruth. His bat had the power of a cannon, and his record of 714 home runs remained unbroken until Hank Aaron came along. The Babe was an idol to sports fans. But in time, age took its toll and his popularity began to wane. Eventually, the Yankees traded him to the Braves, and in one of his very last games in Cincinnati, Babe Ruth began to falter. He was playing really poorly. He struck out. He made several misplays that allowed the Reds to score five runs in a single inning. And as Babe was walking towards the dugout back to the clubhouse, chin down and dejected, there rose from the stands an enormous storm of boos and catcalls. There were actually fans shaking their fists at him. They were heckling him. But then a wonderful thing happened. A little boy jumped over the railing, and with tears streaming down his face, he ran out to the great athlete, and unashamedly, he flung his arms around Babe's legs and held on tightly. And Babe Ruth scooped him up, hugged the little boy, set him back down again, and patted him gently on the head. Then he took his hand And the two walked off the field together. Today, we are talking about what it means to be on the same team when you're trying to help somebody grow. We are diving into the book of Proverbs. And last week, we got started in chapter 2. And what we found is that the line between good and evil is not usually between us and them. That line runs straight down the middle of our hearts. There is a need for each and every one of us to have self-reflection and to pursue wisdom. And so now in our scripture today, we're going to move into the next chapter and see what kind of wisdom we might be able to find. Now it says, my child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. Now, before we get into the meat of the chapter, I want you to notice the framework. He starts out by saying, my child. The way that God approaches giving us wisdom is the same way that a loving father gives wisdom to his children. Now, I would say that probably most of us have been children at some point in our life. And so maybe some of us have even had children. And so we can understand this framework personally. We try to give wisdom to our children because we love them and we want them to prosper. And so what you're going to see in the text is every time Solomon gives some good advice, he pairs it with a line talking about how it's going to benefit you. Parents love their children and they want good things for them. That's why we do the whole teaching wisdom thing. Raising kids, it's not just about keeping someone alive until they're 18, right? You want them to grow and to flourish, right? You want them to have a good life. And the same thing is true of God with his children. God wants you to grow and flourish to become the greatest Christ-like Christian that you could be. So that's the starting point. God has parental love for his children, and he gives wisdom out of a desire to help us grow. Verse 3, it says, Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. So he says, Never let kindness or loyalty leave you. That's the teaching. And he pairs that with, If you do it, then you'll have favor with God and with people, and you'll have a good reputation. Do you see how the teaching is tied with the benefit, right? They want you to think, okay, it's like a father raising his children because he wants them to prosper and thrive. So there's two things we need to hang on to, loyalty 
and kindness. In fact, what we're going to find is that those two features used together give us the tools for loving accountability. When you need to help someone, guide someone, maybe even correct someone, if you let loyalty and kindness be your guide, you will be far more successful. Now, it keeps going in verse 5. And he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Now, there's two pieces. First, again, you hear that whole thing where it says, do the smart thing, positive benefit in your life, right? Like, that's the framework. Like, a parent who wants what's best for his children, so too with God giving us the gift of wisdom. Now, the other thing that we get out of this verse is that God is smarter than you. Right? God is smarter than you. Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. Seek his will. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Now, I want you to hear me on this. Okay, you are lovely and wonderful and created by God. But your God who made you knows more than you do. Right? And he knows what's best for you. God is smarter than you. And I know that sounds obvious, but you wouldn't believe how many of our world's problems really just come down to us trying to do it our way instead of listening and doing it God's way. Now, here's an example from my life. When I was a kid, I used to play soccer. Uh, We'd have practice twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday nights, and then we'd play games on Saturday. Now, I was not a... uh, cautious child when it came to getting messy. If there was mud on the field, it was my personal goal to bring as much of it as humanly possible home smeared on my shirt. My mom used to make me strip down in the garage before she'd let me in the house, you know? Um, And I played incredibly hard. I loved to play soccer, so I'd come home all sweaty and disgusting. Now, another thing about me as a child, I did not like taking showers. Right? I was not interested in being clean at all. So you just have to imagine the stinkiest, muddiest little guy. Right? It's not hard to picture. Just, I mean, there's lots of examples running around. Right? <sighs> so just imagine me standing there with my arms crossed saying, I will not get in the bathtub. Now, my father, not the one in heaven, but the one who lived in my house, he was far wiser than I was. He had all this information about germs and the fact that no one's going to sit next to you if you smell like that. And he, would, <laughs> he was so much wiser than me, and he would very patiently try to explain to me, you have to get in the tub. Come on, you have to get in the tub. Now, he was a lot bigger than I was at that age. So what I would do is we had a two-story house, and I would climb to about the fourth or the fifth step so I could stand there and look him in the eyes. And I'd stand on the fourth step and look him in the eyes and cross my arms. No, I am not taking a bath. I didn't even get that dirty. I don't smell that bad. Beloved church, I cannot explain to you how bad I smelled, okay? Wow. But that's what it looks like when we argue with God, (laughs) right? It's just like a sturdy, stinky little kid trying to seem bigger than he is, screaming because he doesn't want to get clean. Proverbs says, don't lean on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, verse 11 finishes it up for us, and it says, My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline, and don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. Our passage for today bookends by bringing it home to that parental framework. The Lord corrects those he loves, just like a loving father corrects a child in whom he delights. But verse 11 really is the key verse for us. It says in verse 11, My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline, and don't be upset when he corrects you. I truly believe that we could dramatically improve our world if we could just get everybody to read that verse and figure out what it means. There is a false teaching in our culture that in order to love somebody, you must agree with everything they do. Have you heard this, right? If you love me, you will let me do whatever I want. 
Now, here's a silly example. Let's say your husband or your wife makes you dinner, and it doesn't taste very good. So to be safe, let's say it's the husband doing the cooking. And so they cook. <laughs> And they try really hard, and they make the dish, but maybe they put too much salt on it or not enough salt, right, and it tastes kind of bland. And your husband asks you, well, what do you think? And you, fool that you are, tell him the truth. Well, sweetie, it's a little bland. And your husband throws the dinner plates on the ground and casts himself on the couch. I knew it. You hated me all along. (laughs) Trying to help someone improve. Disagreeing and correcting is not hatred. It's actually love. Let's go back to the toddler example, me arguing with my dad. My father, fascist dictator that he was, insisting that my muddy, sweaty, eight-year-old self take a shower was actually his way of loving me, right? It felt like he was rejecting me because he wasn't listening to what I wanted. You don't love me or else you wouldn't make me do something I don't want to do. But I really need you to hang on to this part. It is possible to disagree with someone and still love them. Don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you. The truth is, there are things that you do in your life that as a Christian, you probably shouldn't be doing. There's always going to be room for growth and improvement. And if you let the Holy Spirit into your life, Its first job is to convict you. If you study this book, if you study God's word, you're going to find out my life doesn't look like God wants it to, right? My life is not exactly the way of God's path, and I'm going to feel guilty, and that's a good thing. It is a gift of grace to be able to see where you are and where you should be. Don't reject discipline because it can help you grow, Correction is not rejection. Lovingly guiding someone is not the same thing as hating them. We have to stop pretending that people disagreeing with us is a form of hatred. You can love someone and disagree with them. But do you know what the difference is? Do you know how to tell if, it's correct, if your loving is correction or if it's hateful? We heard it at the beginning of the passage. Loyalty and kindness. When you are in a deep relationship with someone, when you are in a loving community with someone, when you approach them out of loyalty and kindness, they're going to feel that discipline as loving as opposed to hateful. They need to know that you are in their corner. Let me see if I can explain it like this. Imagine there's a guy on the side of the road holding a sign that says, turn or burn, right? Or maybe it's a sign that says, hey, Harold, you put too much salt on the dinner, Right? Or if it's a little sign that says, hey, eight-year-old JJ, you smell bad and you're covered in mud. Now, I don't know that guy, right? And I'm not going to feel that sign as loving discipline or helpful correction. But when it comes from my dad, JJ, you stink, that is discipline that helps me grow. (laughs) Now, I know it's a silly example, right? But I hope you can see what I'm saying. Now, I've been in this church for four years now. And a lot of that has been, uh, you know, through the pandemic. But I feel like we've been through a lot together. And I think even after four years, we're really just starting to get into each other's lives as pastor and congregation. But as we go along, I hope you guys realize that I am invested in this community. I care about all of you and I love you. I want what is good for you. So if I, as a pastor, come in and I say, we got to change things in your life, I'm not just some random guy with a signboard standing on the side of the road. I'm a brother in Christ coming to you out of loyalty and kindness, trying to help you because I'm on your team. Now think about this. How much more so is God your Father in heaven in your corner when he comes to you with correction and discipline? The good news this morning is that God corrects you. God disciplines you. And that's not hateful. That is loving. God disciplines you because he corrects the ones he loves. Last week in chapter 2, we saw that there is potential for good and evil within each of us. This week, we see that God calls out evil. He calls out what is good, and sometimes we're not going to like it. The good news is that God corrects you. God disciplines you. Now, you might be thinking, no, 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 no. God would never discipline me. God would never be mad at me. He loves me too much. And my response to that is, yes. Yes, he does love you too much. He loves you so much, and he knows what's best for you, and he wants to help you get there. 
Listen, if God was only interested in hateful judgment, if God's discipline was only punishment and no transformation, just wrath, then the life of Jesus Christ doesn't make any sense. But because God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Jesus came into this world. He didn't come down to bless everybody, to walk around saying, hey, you're doing great. Keep it up. You're doing just exactly how you're doing it. It's perfect. But he also didn't come down with cond condemnation either. He didn't come down walking around the people, oh, I can't wait to drop you into the burning pit, right? Like, that's not how Jesus did it. He, Jesus came and invested in a relationship with God's people. He brought healing and transformation. He called people to a better life. He died on that cross. He took God's wrath so that you could live corrected. God disciplines you because he knows everything about you. He knows what's best for you. He has a better plan for you than your life of sin. And this is not some guy on the side of the road with a signboard. This is your all-knowing creator God who came into the world to walk with his people. That's loyalty. That's kindness. That's grace. When I was in high school, I had a very dear friend of mine. We'll call him John. And his parents let him do anything he wanted. And in the meantime, my parents were super strict. Right? They had so many rules for me. I, they wanted to know where I was. I had to tell them every time I got into somebody's car. Um, I had the earliest curfew of any of my friends. Everybody were all hanging out, and I had to go home first. And I used to be so jealous of my friend. Right? He had all this freedom. He could do anything he wanted. But I found out later. Like we both, I went off to college, and he went off to do some other stuff. And, and I came back and talked to him years later. And I found out that he resented the fact that his parents let him do anything he wanted. Turned out he had been jealous of me. He had, I, I had parents who were always checking in on me, demonstrating their love through their discipline, forcing me to do stuff I didn't want to do that it ended up making me a better person. But it actually made him feel like his parents didn't care what happened to him. They never disciplined him. He never got in trouble. And at the end of high school, he wasn't even sure if they loved him. Now, I'm sure that they did love him, but it messed him up. Uh, and what I'm trying to show you is that discipline can actually be a sign that you care what happens to someone, right? Discipline from someone who is invested in your life is actually a sign of love. So I have two challenges for you coming out of this teaching. Number one, accept the Lord's teaching. Accept the Lord's discipline. Don't reject it. Don't reject God's challenging, transforming love. I want you to realize that all this stuff he did with Jesus, putting on a human life and living amongst us, this is not some far off, cold and distant God who is waiting to judge us. This is a loving father who knows what's best for his children and he is invested in their lives. God is on your team. God is in your corner. God is rooting for you. He wants what's best for you. So when God has given you correction, when you're feeling that tug on the Holy Spirit in your heart that you're not doing something that's right, don't reject that correction. Pay attention to it. Remember how much God loves you, that how much he knows more than you, and accept the Lord's discipline. Change your life to match God's will. Now, this works vertically between us and God, but it also works between people, right? So my second challenge to you is I want you to cultivate a same team mentality in the family of God. Now, this is something that I teach every couple that gets married in this church, right? Part of the counseling that I make couples go through is in this church is that the teaching that it's not his family and it's not her family, right? It is their family together, right? For me and my wife, Sarah, it's not team JJ, and it's not Team Sarah, it is Team Manshrek, right? You can't approach a brother or sister in Christ and try to help them or correct them unless they know you're on their team. If they feel like you are attacking them, then they're not going to accept correction. But if they know you love them, if they know you are rooting for them and you want what is best for them, they are more likely to listen to you. With your loving encouragement, you can help the people around you realize that you are on the same team. Proverbs says, the Lord corrects who he loves. And we could do the same thing. Now, you might be asking yourself, okay, how? Right? How can I show someone that I'm rooting for them? How can they know? How can I demonstrate that I'm on their team, that I want what's best for them? 
Well, we've heard it twice so far in the message. Loyalty and kindness. There's a lot of superficial community in our world. People connect on social media. People sit next to each other on a Sunday, but maybe they never get into each other's lives. They barely know each other. People have been neighbors for decades, but they never dive deep into each other's lives. You never really invest in one another. Superficial community, superficial faith, it makes it impossible to accept or offer correction. But real growth comes when you realize how much God loves you and you accept his discipline as a sign of that love. Babe Ruth was one of the greatest baseball players of all time. But when he lost a step, the fans turned on him. But in one of his final games towards the end of his career, a little boy ran out onto the field and showed him kindness and loyalty. I can't imagine what that meant to him in that moment. Loyalty and kindness, those are game changers. And I think we all know, even when we don't like to admit it, God knows more than we do. And as our loving Father in heaven, he wants what's best for us. And so I'll leave you with this. May you accept the correction of God as a sign of his investment in your life. May you remember that Jesus came, lived, died, and rose from the grave because of how much he loves you. He is in your corner. And then may you provide that same investment and love into the people around you to create a truly deep Christian community. Amen. This has been another episode of the Simpleton Sermon Podcast. If you appreciate the content, go ahead and give us a shout out, rate and review. Um, that helps the algorithms and more people find this Christian content. Now, of course, I always give my little disclaimer that these sermons, I, I really hope that they help you grow closer to Jesus because that is my ultimate goal with just about everything I do in life. Um, but, but truly, nothing can replace your involvement in a local congregation. So if you are able to plug into the local church to find a body of believers do make sure that they're safe um, but but you do recognize that no church is going to be perfect you're always going to bump up against people um, however as long as it is a safe place that authentically pushes you closer to Jesus make sure you plug into that body of believers it's just such an amazing way to grow closer to Jesus uh, we will see you back next week and until then I am looking forward to the future bye <laughs>